So how do I challenge those aesthetics of math in a way that also honors the different ways that my students can represent their understanding? So it's, yes, I'm still teaching math. That's what's paying the bills. Um, but as well, and how am I helping them to represent it in a way that they have, that they understand, that allows them to be kinesthetic with it, maybe representing patterns in braids, maybe through poetry, maybe through an art installation that they create, or podcasts, like ways that give them other ways to represent their understanding beyond just a paper test, and then getting validation through high stakes testing. And where I am growing, um, is trying to reflect on what has been my own training from my undergrad to my master's. And that was, oh, well, you're training young mathematicians, call them scholars. But I've been reflecting more on what has been my own journey and my joys and pains, but really thinking about how I'm not training mathematicians. I'm encouraging my students to be confident in their mathematical knowings. And in order for to help highlight that, I have to get to know that and broaden my own understanding of mathematics. That's part of my project. That's Francis. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Cara M. And I think of myself as a teacher with teachers. I used to use the word teacher kind of for teachers, louder. And um, I'm, I live in New York City. That's kind of my current home place. I moved to New York City in 1998 with a social studies degree. And it, uh, through advisement and coaching, I uh, also decided to pursue a second credential in mathematics. Um, for many years, I taught middle school. And um, after several years of teaching middle school in New York City, um, I realized that I loved working with teachers as well. And so uh, I became eventually the co-director of a space called Math in the City. Um, some of you might know that space at City College. I got to build mathematical communities of teachers from across the country and beyond. And we thought a, little, a lot about what that work looked like. I'm now going to interrogate that work. Um, but it was a really happy part of who I am as a, as a person. Um, I also started learning by becoming a researcher, kind of a reluctant researcher. I wasn't sure I wanted to be a tenured professor and to do research my whole life, but I was really uh, wanting to participate um, in the work of mathematics education beyond the work I could do as a, as a coach or as a uh, kind of teacher educator. I wrote a dissertation that I defended during the pandemic um, uh, that was the title of which is Modeling Where It Matters, Redesigning Math Education with Adolescent Girls of Color. I was really really f concerned about and fixated with a, a paradigm in New York City and beyond that I would call re repeaters algebra, the ways in which systems um, treat algebra as a gatekeeping device. And it's designed to keep some children out of higher mathematics. Um, it's designed to keep and allow other children to pass through. And that gatekeeping effect is gendered. Um, it's about class. It's about race. And I was really interested in trying to disrupt it through research. So I, d I have a design study. Study. And what that meant is I was simultaneously a teacher and a researcher at the same time. I didn't want to contribute to that paradigm um, that has been solidified and is part of bigger structures like white supremacy. I wanted to, to imagine something different. Um, so my study is about what, class, what a classroom would look like and what role mathematical modeling might play in um, centering girls of color's stories and lives and mathematical identities. I'm still learning from that research um, and I'm glad to be in this space. My project now. I work uh, in partnership with schools across the country, specifically New York City and State, including some schools of colleagues in this room. So shout out to all of you. Um, I think I'm intrigued and growing by this work. I'm, I find words like, uh, empty, like um, equity and inclusion and algebra for all, I find them kind of empty rhetoric. And it's very easy as a white woman trying to do good work to pat myself on the back for work that is not um, dismantling and not substantial and not transformative. And 
doesn't um, interrogate my own privilege and power as a white woman. So I kind of needed a place um, that is here to really think about that work. I also um, have found that though I love mathematical community, it was another space where I didn't need to think about all the beautiful intersectional and unique mathematical identities that were in that community, including many that were devalued. And so I'm kind of holding in place the, the importance of acknowledging mathematical identities that are intersectional, that are racialized and gendered, but I'm also kind of thinking about how that plays into a space called mathematical community. Um, and I guess finally, I'm learning through Rochelle and through my friends and colleagues here how to be an accomplice and not just an ally. Um, Rochelle wrote a beautiful paper in 2017 about uh, backlash in math education, and that has been speaking to me for a while. For me, that means kind of really um, interrogating all the ways that I benefit from a system of power and privilege, how I use language to give you a specific example. I think I used words previously. I would consider things like kids on the margins, and now I understand that those kids have been marginalized by systems, but that's not a neutral act. They didn't end up there um, by happenstance. Um, and so the work is really um, much bigger, much heavier, and I'm, I'm really delighted to be here and to take something back with me to New York City. It's still in development, and I, I look forward to kind of developing it um, throughout this week with my colleagues and friends. Thanks, Cara. I'm Patrick Morris. I'm a, a math professor at Foothill College in Los Altos Hills, California. That's in Silicon Valley. We're an open access community college. Um, Google and Facebook and Apple, they're all right there. Um, I've been at Foothill for about 20 years, 21. I had about 10 years in teaching before that, and I had a first career about 12 years before that. Y'all can do the math. Um, so I got to the I got to the classroom, and I I was uh, I, I came in as an, uh, my first career was an actuary. I was building and using mathematical models of contingent financial events. So I came to came to teaching, and I said, "Well, I'll just make a mathematical model of student learning. How hard could it be?" And I tried, and I've got a lot of background with modeling, and it took me about 15 years to realize that the mathematical model of points in grading is, is, gets in the way of student learning. So in 2008, I abandoned points and percentages in my grading, and I made qualitative assessment version 1.0. I have been challenged along the way, more, most recently by some of the concepts in rehumanizing mathematics, in particular the way that the body and the emotions impact student learning and, and its display. Um, so I'm working now to move from version 7.4, which is the last version of assessment policies I used in the classroom, I'm going to write 8.0, and it's going to acknowledge the embodied nature of student learning and assessment. This, uh, this final exam, that that's a sea of desks in a final exam. What I realized right away in my teaching career is that the information that I got from situations like that was inaccurate. And I mean that, and, and maybe you could even raise the sea of show of hands if you've had the experience of having a conversation with a student who scores per poorly on exams, but in conversation displays incredible knowledge. Anyone had that experience? Yeah, yeah, I had that early and often. So what it told me was that with this kind of assessment, I'm getting the wrong answer. And I dug into that. I don't want to get the wrong answers. I'm got a lot, just a lot of math schooling. I know, I know what that feels like. So I dug into it and said, well, what's actually going on here? And I found that I'm, I'm what I'm making is type two errors. I am. No, okay, you're scaring me there, Charles. Yeah, all right, there we go. I'm making, I'm making type two errors, and what that means is that I'm, I'm deciding that a student is not qualified on the basis of information from this kind of a situation, even though they are, so I've made a mistake. And I, I don't want to make those mistakes. And it got, it got uh, as I dug into it further, I realized that those mistakes are, are absolutely racially predictable. So I imagine, what is it that I'm actually assessing here besides student learning. And then I go to my college website and I look at the test taking skills. You can look up your own, right? And like how to take a high stakes test, right? We try to try to give students the tools that they need to succeed. And 
That to me is a key that we're at, we're assessing not just student learning, but also assimilation into the assessment structure. Right, so the students that are not as well assimilated, and I'll just say it right here, who has not had access to the kind of assimilation training, brown and black students, I'm assessing them on how well they've assimilated to my culture, not just their math knowledge. I wanted to stop doing that. I don't want to, because that turns me into a racial filter. I'm the gatekeeper here, and I, I want to stop that. So that's what drove me, that's part of what drove me into my, my uh, rethinking assessment. So I just, um, in 90 seconds, I want to share an idea or a concept, a picture, uh, maybe a proof of concept. This is a final exam in my discrete math class. Um, these folks will be elect uh, these folks will be computer scientists in Silicon Valley. They'll transfer next year. I also teach differential equations. They'll all be electrical engineers. And and I want to point out the two things that are going on here. Um, that I heard in your comments. I heard um, teacher-student relationship. I have a very different relationship with these students than I did when I was in a standardized test, and it's, it brings me joy. And the second thing is math and community that I heard. Right? These are people that are doing math in community, and it's a far more, the results I get, the, uh, the uh, artifacts that they generate are so revealing of their learning that I can, I can reduce the, the number of type two errors that I make. So my challenge here at, at, uh, in Park City is to, how, what does that look like? What, how can I rewrite my policies to, to embed the, the knowledge that um, mathematical knowings are embodied? And that will be a rewrite of my policies. Um, in particular, I want to not only reduce the stress, the anxiety, that's an embodied expression, the anxiety of an assessment situation that blocks student access to their own ability. I want to, I want to acknowledge that as an embodiment um, dimension. But another one is that I want students to dial in to the wisdom of their bodies. And I'm going to try to write those up in my policies before I leave here. Thank you. All right. Um, is that working? Okay, cool. Uh, in the spirit of like everything we're discussing, I can't. I got to stand up. I'm like really, I'm really uh, stressing out just sitting here. And I think I will give you a better talk if you let me stand up. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm Claudio Jacobo Gomez Gonzalez. You've already met me. Um, I'm a professor at Carleton College. Um, uh, this is like these icons in the top right sort of indicate a journey of like beginning, uh, I went to college sort of near where I grew up at New Mexico Tech in Socorro. Um, I went to the University of Chicago for grad school, postdoc at UC Irvine. Um, and these uh, below them are some, some unions and other groups that I've been affiliated with along the way. Um, you can see along the right some, some uh, campaigns that I've been involved in. On the left you can see some research. I, I do like arithmetic topology. This is a lovely rendering, uh, totally original. I made every part of it. Um, um, uh, the relationship between topology and arithmetic that sort of motivates a lot of the things we think about. Um, I've got some lovely pictures from student projects here and oh this one's really fun. Uh, ask me about that one. That one's a, a joy. Um, and you know these are some pictures of mathematicians uh, involved in fighting for their own rights and all these great sorts of things. Um, so my project, go ahead and take us to the next one, Rachel. thank you so much. Um, my project is, I, I have a bit of freedom um, and I'm, I'm excited to sort of flex it. Um, I'm teaching a class, it's called a argument and inquiry, it's a thing when you're a first year at Carleton, um, in your first term, uh, you take this A and I class, which is like a place where you're supposed to learn to like engage critically with your writing, your reading, your discussing, your argue, all these things. And um, any sort of tenure track faculty, oh, what happened? Well, I'll let you figure that out. Uh, any uh, <laughs> uh, tenure track faculty can offer one, but well, it hasn't been one offered in the math department in a while, so I was really excited to, to go ahead and do this. Um, and I want to mention this um, framework that Rochelle already mentioned, Hirsch, yeah? The, the front and the back. Um, this idea of like, I mean, for those of you that have worked in, this is a metaphor from the article, um, those of you that have worked in food service, you know the front, like when you're like a waiter, you, you come out and you're like, oh yes, here's the food, you know, there's like this presentation. And then when you go to the back, you're like, oh my God, the guy at table six was, you know, there's this whole like change in the back, the messiness happens, the real work is happening. And in the front, there's this like presentation. And so much of mathematics with students is about this front, right? This sort of idea that like, I mean, I think if you ask 
ask a lot of students think that math is some sort of immutable rules that like have sort of existed forever and there's no sort of connection between humans and the rules that we're using. Whereas one of the strategies that I really take in mind in rehumanizing mathematics, and it fits well with this A and I framework, um, is giving them a peek into the back, right? So in this class, which is specifically built around probability, statistics therein, the, the idea is I want students, well, there's really nothing up there, huh? All right, well, let's keep going. Um, I don't have my bullets. But the idea is that I want students to think about not only that math is a human activity, but that human experiences are informed by mathematics, right? Like the mathematics that we like develop in our institutions inform the ways that we as humans are supposed to interpret the world around us. So this example for us, probability and statistics, this is like a, I mean, it was sort of a metaphysical, epistemic, uh, sort of all the words, success story of like the 19th century that has totally changed how we think about the world. I want students to have a chance to interrogate that. Yeah? And, and it's giving us this great framework. I'll mention, I don't know, how much time do I left? Okay, I gotta, wrap, I gotta wrap up. You don't get to see my bullets, sorry. They were so good, oh well. Um, one of the ideas, uh, I'll just give you an example to give you something concrete. Um, people are familiar with PageRank, yeah? Google the internet, page rank, yeah? Ranking the internet, all that stuff. Uh, oh, right there. Hey, there it is. Next slide. <laughs> they missed all that. Yeah, that's all right. Um, one of the things I want to do here is I want them to think about page rank as a artifact of math as a political activity, right? And one way that you can think about page rank is a random walk on the internet, yeah? What better way to do this than to give students a bunch of chalk, my dice bag from Dungeons and Dragons, and tell them to start doing a random walk and to interrogate things like what sort of topological features are like influencing which pages are important, yeah? According to this algorithm, really sort of suss it out and feel it in their movements around the space. Then you can push them further and say, hey, so what's going on with like, what, what, what features are interesting? Do you ever see those come up in your everyday life? Because y'all are on the internet 24 seven. I know you, before you wake up, you're on TikTok thinking about that algorithm, I want them to make some connection between this mathematical activity they're doing in their class, the math that they see around them, and then I want them to complicate that with research from, say, like, uh, Sophia Nobles, other black feminist scholars, thinking about the ways that Google and the search epistemology shapes the way that we, like, think about truth and think about the world. This is an example, rehumanizing mathematics. I'll stop now. I'm out of time. Yeah, you said it, whatever. They were so good. Oh, well. Thanks, everyone. Do you want to introduce the other people on the Uh Yes, so um, before we get, jump into Q&A, it will be, um, give us a chance to introduce the rest of our colleagues. And we have mics on the left and mics on the right. So feel free to introduce. We'll start on the left, well, my left, sorry. Directions, right? Vectors. Hello, my name is Chadwick Johnson, uh, math teacher, high school math teacher in Boston. Woohoo! Yeah, Chadwick. Yeah, Hi, my name's um, Octavia Beckles. I'm a math educator and consultant um, from Canada, the greater Toronto area. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Charles Wilkes. I'm a postdoc researcher at San Diego State University. Hello, everyone. My name is Richard Velasco. I'm an assistant professor of math education at the University of Oklahoma. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Amy Vickers, and I teach at a technical college in the rural north, northern Wisconsin. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Wilfred Olangi from the University of the Philippines, Baguio. So I'm from the Philippines. Uh, I'm an indigenous person and a mathematician. I work in the area of indigenous people's education. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Ila Varma. I'm a professor in number theory, assistant professor at University of Toronto. I am Adriana Mejia, I'm from Colombia. I am Adriana Mejia, I am a, I'm from Colombia. I am a math professor and I research in theory of categories. All right, 
right. Yeah, so at this point, um, good reason to introduce ourselves that we will be doing presentations later, but we'll wrap that up and talk about that. But for now, um, we would love to open it up to any questions um, that you may have already written on your index card or that you have. You're going to pass them to the people. Oh, yes, sorry. Yes, you're going to pass your index cards after you write your questions down to the to my colleagues on your right or your left, depending on where you are sitting. So that way we can get a whole stack. Thank you for passing those questions along. <laughs> Yeah, it does say low battery too. Mm -hmm. We'll make it. Low battery. Mm -hmm. you got a, you got a battery. Yeah. So So as we again, the question's coming up. Um, if you want to learn more about our individual projects and our action plans and what we're doing um, with more depth, we can um, we'll invite you to our showcase that will be this Friday from 12 to 1. It will be a work and, well, a presentation lunch. And so you'll get a chance to hear from anyone that you um, would want to hear from or all of us. And that will be over in the smaller lunch tent. We'll have it set up for that. Um, so thank you. And now we have a few questions. All right, I'll get start with the first one. As a graduate student who is well down the food chain, <laughs> influence or suggest to faculty to change their approaches, or do you have any influence or suggestions to faculty to change their approaches to math education? Woohoo! Shot at that? Why, why would you nominate me? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, <laughs> because it's hard, right? I mean, like, the, especially at, at, at these institutions that we're in, there's a sort of systemic issue where, like, doing that is not in your interests, right? You're supposed to do research. You're supposed to do all these things, yeah? Um, and I think, um, I mean, I have answers for you, but I don't want to get super lost. Um, I think. You're right. The, sort of the, this positionality of the graduate student is is a really difficult one to overcome. And I think there's a bigger picture uh, with a bigger community of people that that can bring to bear or bring to light sort of the necessity for this type of work. Um, it can be like in your relationship to the advisor, or relationship with other graduate students, many graduate students together, um, in relation to this professor. I have a lot of thoughts. I. I don't want to get us lost, um, but but yeah, I, I think I think there are ways to communicate the necessity of this work. Like it's not just a sort of frivolous thing. It's not just for fun. And um, I want to find you and talk to you. Let's, let's talk more. Yeah. Uh, this is to me. When passing from quantitative to qualitative exams, how do you mitigate the effects of personal bias? Excellent question. Um, I have a, I have a bias check built into my procedures, and that is that I look at my grade book first with the names hidden, and just looking at the data, the lines of data, and I come up with a grade that way. Then I hide the grades, and I show the names. And then that, then I do the same thing. And then that brings in all of the, uh, my relationship understanding, I, the conversations that I've heard, and I do the same grades having, not having a, a look at what the first draft was. So then I put the two drafts side by side, and 70% of the time, it's the same grade that goes on the transcript. Um, most of the rest of them, the, uh, the grades differ by one click, like an A minus or a B plus. I go with the higher grade. 